Today we're going to talk about eternity. And just that word, the idea of eternity or infinity, it, it gets our minds racing. Like the cosmologists and the scientists, we too would just love to touch the hem of the universe. The edge where our universe ends and eternity or infinity begins. The first Christmas is very much a statement about eternity. Let's look at our scripture passage this morning, verses 4 and 5. John, in his very poetic language, makes it clear that Jesus' is coming to this planet is a statement about eternity. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought life to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God came to this planet to, well, illumine the reality that God loves us, to illumine and change our lives from the inside out. He, he came to illumine our path that leads from this life to the next couple more passages that punctuate this for us. Luke chapter 1, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will what? Never end. And then finally, passage we've looked at the last couple of weeks, Luke 2, 11. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. The Messiah, the Lord, the Savior, each of those titles of Jesus carry with them a, a great sense of eternity. As Carol read in the, the scripture for our Advent lighting today, He will come as Savior to gather us up so that we would what? Spend eternity with Him. Eternity is what God promised us. Eternity is, well, what Christmas is all about. It begins really in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2. The Bible reminds us that human beings were created in the image of God. And that image of God was set in a, a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. That we were created in the image of God, well, we're, we're stamped with that reality. That's what makes us different than, well, everything else that was created. And despite the popular movie, The Rise of the Planet of the Apes, As smart as chimpanzees are, they'll never be a creature created in the image of God. We were created in the image of God because it was God's desire that we spend our existence with Him. That we're special in that. And because we're created in the image of God, that's a promise that God makes to us that even the failure of our sin removing us from the Garden of Eden cannot distinguish. It is what God promised in the Christmas reality, isn't it? Look at John 3.16. Here John kind of sums up what he's been talking about in the coming of Jesus to our planet. He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have what? Eternal life, everlasting life. It was His purpose. It was His mission it's what God promised, and God made good on His promises by coming personally so that 
we can believe in him and we can have eternal life. Eternal life. I I wonder what eternal life is going to be like. Some would say that no one really knows what heaven or eternity is going to be like. Like one mother whose eight-year-old son was busy drawing at the table one Christmas. The mother asked her, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm I'm drawing a picture of, of heaven, of eternity. And she said, well, nobody really knows what heaven or eternity is going to be like. The little boy declared, they will when I finish. (laughs) See, the Bible does detail for us some very important things about what eternity, what heaven is really going to be like. There are 134 different references in the Bible to heaven. Five key passages point out that, number one, heaven's going to be a a very glorious place, a wonderful place to be. Simply take all the wonderful things in life and just put them end to end. Christmas time, there's very uh, great meaning, great experience, great joy, great celebration. Just take that experience and multiply it to the nth degree. And now we're getting pretty close to what eternity is going to be like, how glorious it will be. Revelation 21 also says that it's a, a place where there's no more pain and no more suffering. And we'll take that, won't we? I mean, if we're going to have a, a heavenly experience, it can't have pain and suffering. We, we got plenty of that now. And we can imagine, can't we for a moment just imagine a place where there isn't any pain or suffering, no more tears, no more stress, anxiety? Wow. I want to go there. Yeah. The Bible says in Luke that we will have bodies that are immortal. We'll be like the angels. And we get to hear a little bit about the angels as we move through the Bible, even in the Christmas story. They obviously spoke so that the shepherds understood them. They too are special, not created in the image of God, though. And they have these heavenly bodies, Ah, so will we. Heaven is a place where we're perfectly in the presence of God. Christmas time is one of those experiences where we feel more maybe in the presence of God than other times during the year. We come to worship and we feel a connection. I was at a party yesterday and This is how a a man that spoke to me described his relationship with God. He said, I feel a connection between my soul and the soul of God. My spirit and the spirit of God. And when we come to worship, we, we feel that connection. We feel that presence with God and we think to ourselves, wow, if we could just have that all the time. Wouldn't that be awesome? Ah, That's what heaven's like. It's feeling that special connection with Christ that we feel and worship all the time. And then finally, the, the Bible says, heaven is the place where your service will be celebrated and rewarded. God is equipping us and calling us to to do things in his name, in his honor. And we often want to think, well, we're just doing that and God's not really paying attention. Oh, yes, he is. He's cheering us on. And when we get to heaven, he will celebrate our service and reward us for the service that we've done in his name while we were here on this planet. Yeah, heaven's going to be a great party on our behalf, a great celebration. 
And when we get this picture of heaven, our thought is, who wouldn't want to go there? Who wouldn't want to enjoy all of that? Eternity creates a little bit of a dilemma, though. We're here. How do we get there? And as we think of eternity and and, and infinity, we clearly have this, this feeling that, well, eternity is a long ways away. That's a long ways away experientially, and it seems to be a long ways away spiritually. We intrinsically understand that there is a separation between us and eternity. Christmas is about God, an infinite God, becoming finite, a human being. And the reason God did that is he realized that we have a a yearning for eternity, a yearning to be with him, yet we cannot bridge the gap between us and him. We don't need to have a, a PhD in philosophy to understand that God is big and we are small. Because we're small, so to speak, we can't get to God who is big, infinite, But we can understand that a big God can choose to become small. And that's what God chose to do at Christmas time. The scriptures detail that for us quite well in Matthew chapter 1. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Oh. We yearn for eternity. We yearn for a relationship with God. But what has created the the distance, the gap between us and eternity is our sin. Our sinfulness is what keeps us from God. And it isn't as though we haven't tried to get to God. In fact, that's why we have so many world religions because everybody's trying to get get to God, be in relationship with God, connect with God. Yet because of sin, all that human effort falls short. We're too small. We're too imperfect. We're sinners and we can't bridge the gap to this infinite holy God. And God knows our yearning. God knows that He placed that yearning within us when we were created in His image. And so He came personally to save us from our sins. This child in a cave will become a man on a cross. And in His death, in His forgiveness, in His resurrection, we have resurrection. And God in Christmas does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. But if we could, we would. The problem is we can't. We cannot bring the new life that is required for us to live in eternity. John states it this way. But to all who believe him and accepted him he gave the right to become children of God they are reborn not with physical rebirth but a birth that comes from God it's a spiritual rebirth and isn't that what it's going to take for these physical bodies to get to eternity it's going to it's going to take a change and that change The Bible calls that a a spiritual rebirth. Because yes, and thank God, these mortal bodies will stay behind. You will be much more angelic when you get to heaven. And we will be transformed. 
We're transformed because we experience this new life, this rebirth on the inside. And notice what that rebirth is triggered by. Belief in Jesus Christ. And belief isn't all that hard to, to understand, I don't think. Number one, it's, it's faith in the facts. And there's plenty of facts for us to know. In fact, Rick's going to teach a class after the first of the year about the facts of the Bible, the authority of the Bible. And it doesn't matter whether it's the Bible or Jesus Christ or God. There are good answers to our good questions. In fact, there are great answers to our great questions. And God wants to answer the questions of our mind, heart, and soul so that we can spend eternity with Him. Now, the truth is, is we don't know the facts about anything, really. Not all the facts, do we? It begins with whether the alarm's going to go off in the morning. When I first started preaching, I had to put, I put two clocks out <laughs> every morning. One on a battery just to make sure I got up. Right? You go to bed and you flip the switch and you're, you have faith that it's going to wake you up in the morning. And then you move from one faith experience to another. Uh, you know, I set the coffee pot up. I, you know, I, I got to have my coffee in the morning. And by faith, I put the grounds in the little container in the water and set it. But have you ever gotten up and... You know, you set your automatic coffee maker and you got up the next morning and there wasn't any coffee in there? Yeah. And then we go downstairs and we get in our car. We have to have a little faith it's going to start. Have you ever tried to start your car and it didn't start? Yeah. Wow. Then we got to go to the first corner. There's a stop sign there at my house and then I have to put my brakes on. You ever have your brakes not work? Mm, yeah. Wow. Wow. It takes a lot of faith just to get to church on Sunday morning. Yeah, it does. It takes a lot of faith to live in this world. And if we said to ourselves, I have to know every single fact, we wouldn't be able to live. Because all of us exercise a step of faith Many times throughout the day. That's all Christ is asking of us is a step of faith, a trust. We can't let the lack of facts keep us from action in life. And that's true in faith as well. Faith in the facts, trust where we don't have the facts, and then we must act, we must believe. We must receive. And when we exercise our volitional will and take a step of faith, God confirms in us that He started something in our life on the inside. Listen to Colossians. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Think about things of heaven. And you know we do. I think it's our thinking about heaven that actually leads us to belief. And I think we think about heaven in, in two experiences of life. Number one is the pain. When we're suffering pain, I think we think about heaven. We think about a moment or a time or a place where we wouldn't have to experience that pain. And it doesn't matter whether that's physical pain or emotional pain. In that moment of pain, we can think of it, we can imagine a state where we will not or would not have to experience this pain. Hmm. Isn't that what heaven's all about? No pain, no suffering, no crying? Yeah. And I think the other signpost that, that we think about heaven is in our pleasure. A lot will happen this Christmas season and, and to create the right environment, the right emotion. 
And when we experience that great emotion, we say to ourselves, oh, if I could just freeze frame this moment, this great experience, and just relive it over and over and over again. Oh. What we're really saying is, is we're looking for eternity. We really want to be in heaven because that's that pleasurable, pleasurable experience all the time. That is the place where the pain and the suffering and the tears are no more. We do think about heaven. And as we think about heaven, that enacts our belief. And as we experience that, that faith, that believing, God confirms that to us through the Holy Spirit in the new life that is ours to enjoy and to share. I want to close by quoting the great Apostle Paul, Romans 10, 9 through 13. He kind of puts it all together for us. He writes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. Notice it doesn't say by attending church every Sunday reading your Bible every day, getting rid of your bad habits or serving all the time. Notice that's not what Paul says. He says it's by believing and that's something we can all do. That's something we all do in our life is believe. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by the confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the Scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in Him, everyone who calls upon Him, the name of the Lord, they will be saved. That's why Jesus Christ came to this planet. He came to this planet to bridge the gap between us and eternity. He came to this planet to make good on His promise when He created us in His image. And who wouldn't want to spend eternity with God? It is His great Christmas gift to each and every one of us. It is God's expression of love so that as we believe in Him, we will not perish, but we will have everlasting, eternal life with Him. Let us pray. Lord, we are people who want to pray to You and ask that You would help us in our unbelief. For Lord, we, we desire to connect with You. We desire to spend eternity with You. And Lord, we, we understand that that means believing in you, confessing you, trusting you, asking you to be the leader of our life. And Lord, as we, we ask you to lead our life, Lord, we know that you are doing a, a, a new spiritual rebirth inside of us. And Lord, allow us to grow and mature in that birth, confirming over and over again the reality that you are our Lord and that you have a full life and an everlasting life in store for us. And Lord, we are thankful for this Christmas season, all the ways that we're reminded about the truth and the reality, your promise confirmed that your desire is that we would be your children and that we would be a part of your family not only now but for all eternity. Lord, thank you for being that special Christmas gift to all of us. And so we pray these things in your name. Amen.